Uh, welcome to uh, some of you that have been, I think, on all six of these uh, uh, Zoom, Zoom calls. And to those of you that are new, uh, welcome. We hope you find some value in this um, and in the future ones as well. Um, you know, the, uh, the purpose of these, you know, for all of these are basically, you know, for attending firms and architects, practitioners um, uh, to, you know, kind of share best practices, frankly, firm operation issues, staff well-being uh, and project delivery. We're covering lots of topic or, uh, topics over the next few weeks, as you can tell. Uh, it's also a forum for us to share concerns or challenges. And if you have any requests for the, of the AIA-LA, um, this is a great time to kind of uh, share those or, or, or ask those questions. Um, also that we just want to remind everybody that on the uh, AIA website, uh, AIA Los Angeles website, there are lots of resources as it pertains to uh, the COVID-19 um, that connect you both to kind of local, state, and national um, issues as, as it surrounds the subject matter. Um, and um, so kind of with that, uh, I would like to introduce our, our guest today, uh, Kimberly Dowdell, AIA NOMA. Um, she is the president of Na National Organization for Minority Architects and the Director of Business Development for HOK. Uh, and she is located in Chicago. Uh, Kimberly is the 2019-20 president, as I mentioned. Uh, she won the 2020 AIA Young Architects Award honoring individuals who have demonstrated exceptional leadership and made significant contributions to the architecture profession early in their careers. Kimberly is a member of the Detroit Developer Roundtable and uh, the Urban Land Institute. She initiated the concept behind social economic environmental design, an organization that she co-founded in 2005 and was a Crane's Detroit Business 40 Under 40 honoree. In 2019, Kimberly delivered the 19th annual Dunlop Lecture at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. And so with that, uh, Kimberly, uh, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Hello, everyone. Um, so today, so I'm going to start by sharing my screen, uh, and then I'm going to talk to you about the topic of diverse cities, a little bit of a play on words, but um, can everyone see my slides? This, yes? Okay, cool. Um, so a little bit of a play on words, diversity. Um, you know, I, I sincerely believe that uh, in order for our, the future of our cities to be stronger, um, it, you know, our cities need to be, and so the, to, to a large extent, our cities are diverse, but I do believe that our profession, um, architecture, should reflect the, the populations that we serve, which, which is everyone. And so uh, the topic, diversity, shaping the future of the urban built environment, is, um, you know, really going to take us through, um, first, a personal story, and then I'll zoom out to, um, you know, what NOMA is, is doing um, in an effort to, uh, to help diversify our profession, which will have an impact on the future of our city. So this image is the Hudson Department Store in uh, Detroit, Michigan, which is my hometown. Uh, so this, these photos were taken before I was even born, but uh, the Hudson Department Store, just by way of background, is uh, one of the, uh, actually, it, a certain point, the second largest department store uh, in the country. Um, however, when, uh, when I was born, that particular department store was shuttered along with many other buildings in the core of downtown Detroit. So when I was a kid, um, this is essentially what, what Hudson's uh, looked like. Uh, the streets of Detroit were pretty desolate at that time. Um, so when I was about 11 years old, I remember looking at this building and saying, oh, I, I would like to become an architect because I just learned what an architect was in an art class recently. And, and, and I said, well, if architects make or fix buildings, then I, I want to become an architect and I want to fix the Hudson's building and I want to, you know, help be a part of uh, the revitalization of Detroit. And so that's kind of my origin story in architecture, uh, again, around middle school. So when I was in high school, this happened. They demolished the Hudson's department store, so I did not get to work on that. Um, but my passion for cities uh, was really ignited um, during that period of time. Um, and, I, and I really became very curious about what happened to Detroit to make it, um, you know, turn into sort of this um, 
this version of itself that it, I knew that it wasn't earlier um, in its history. And it wasn't just the downtown core, it was the neighborhoods as well. So I was so passionate about this issue that I uh, actually did my undergraduate thesis on the topic of what happened to Detroit and how can an architectural or a series of architectural interventions um, have an impact on that, uh, on you know, essentially revitalizing the city. So one of the things that I, I gathered during my research was um, you know, just how dense of a city it, it used to be. So this uh, top image shows a uh, Detroit neighborhood in 1949. And then around the time I did my thesis in 2003, that same neighborhood that was plagued by disinvestment primarily, um, you know, uh, ended up yielding uh, an urban fabric that looked like this. And so one of the things that I, I learned during um, my thesis year was just the incredibly um, strong impact that policies of, you know, the 30s, 40s, and 50s uh, in, in particular had on neighborhoods in, in, uh, in cities. And so this, this map at the um, top of the screen shows a, uh, what's called a residential security map, but I think it's most often known as uh, sort of a redlining map. And so if you look at the areas in red, uh, those are, are noted as fourth grade and basically less desirable for investment. And so when you look at the areas of Detroit in particular, that uh, are shaded with red, those are the areas that were disinvested, and those are the areas that very strongly um, correlate to communities of color, particularly African-American communities. And because of, of such um, you know, drastic disinvestment in those particular neighborhoods, um, you know, we really saw limited access to, um, to capital, to education, jobs, quality foods, healthcare, transportation, technology, many of the things that, um, that we're seeing unfortunately play out uh, relative to COVID-19 and how it's having such a dramatic impact on communities of color. Um, but you know, these are some of the, the core things that happened um, decades ago that sort of set uh, communities of color up for uh, the, the struggles that we're seeing play out today. And this isn't just Detroit. In fact, there's a book by uh, Richard Rothstein called The Color of Law that discusses how this happened all over the country. And so it was this, this early exploration of mine that really got me interested in how architecture and how architects can, um, you know, really facilitate positive change. And, uh, and that really led me to study uh, public, public administration uh, for my graduate, uh, graduate school studies, um, actually just five or six years ago. Uh, you know, I, I thought it was important that while architects shape the future of the built environment, it's, it's also policy design that, um, that has an impact on what architects are, are able to do or empowered to do uh, through development and, and, uh, and public work. So what happened after, actually while I was finishing up my, um, my thesis year or my time at, at, um, in architecture school, I did an internship with the federal government uh, with uh, AIA Los Angeles member, Steve Lewis. Um, and while I was interning with him, I came up with an idea for um, what's now known as uh, SEED or social economic environmental design. And really the impetus behind that was growing up in a city like Detroit and wanting to better understand how we could, um, you know, take what's, what's happening in, in the development environment and make sure that we're, you know, we're really addressing a lot of the issues that, um, you know, that we're seeing plague, um, you know, plague poor communities, plague uh, communities of color. And so um, Steve gave me an article to read uh, in Metropolis Magazine, uh, I think it was like June 2005, and it was, a, it was by Lance Hosey entitled the, the Ethics of Brick, and that article really inspired uh, the notion of the federal government. I was working for, for GSA at the time in the office of the chief architect. And the idea was, you know, if the federal government was requiring all projects to achieve some level of, of LEED certification, then, you know, maybe we could create something, call it SEED, um, you know, so that, that federal buildings in particular would be uh, the best possible neighbors that, you know, kind of help to spur uh, positive investment and, and help communities. Um, particularly those that are under-resourced. So years later, um, I guess for, fast forward to today, um, as the NOMA president, one of the things that, that we talk about so often is uh, inclusion and then diversity inclusion, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And then most recently, we've been having a lot of discussions about justice, equity, 
diversion, uh, diversity, sorry, not diversion, uh, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And, you know, we, uh, you know, been talking about this whole notion of Jedi, um, you know, not the Star Wars Jedi, but the, you know, the notion of you know, how do we, how do we foster greater justice in the built environment? How do we, um, you know, how do we look at our cities in a, in a way that, um, you know, that it's, it's equitable for, for everyone who lives there? Um, and in, in particular, as we look at the architecture profession, how do we foster greater diversity and inclusion? Because if we as architects are the authors of the future of the built environment, then, you know, we have a, a profound responsibility to make sure that what we're doing uh, reflects the values of, of everyone who, who lives in the built environment. So I'm going to talk just generally about cities and some of the trends that we're going to see happening in the future and, um, you know, just really underscore why it's so important uh, that we look at our profession as, as one of the real champions of the change that we're going to want to see, um, you know, based on the experiences that, that I've had, that I mentioned um, briefly, um, you know, my personal mission is to improve the quality of life for people living in cities. And at this point, I, I now live in Chicago. I've been here for almost a year. Uh, I lived in Detroit most recently over the last four years, um, working in city, to go, uh, city government and then also real estate development. Um, before that, I studied uh, public administration uh, in Boston. Uh, and then I lived in New York City for six years. Uh, before that, Washington, D.C., and a small town uh, in upstate New York. Ithaca, but I'm, you know, as I mentioned before, originally from Detroit. So I've had a nice sampling of, of many cities and actually I studied abroad in Rome. So that counts as another great city uh, across the globe. And so I'm really passionate about how do we as architects, you know, have a, have a positive impact on the future of our cities. So the first thing um, to, to note is that density, further uh, densification of our cities is definitely happening. Um, and so, the, the blue dots denote uh, current megacities, and then the, the orange dots denote future megacities. Um, and so we're actually going to see an expansion of cities and you know what's known as the global south. But you know there's going to be a tremendous amount of growth, uh, and so uh, as cities become more dense, um, you know I think there's a real challenge, but also I think an even greater opportunity for us to think creatively about how to make sure that a higher population of people can live in, you know, essentially the same amount of space uh, in, a, in a peaceful and harmonious and healthy way. The other thing to note, at least in the U.S. context, is that diversity is happening. So by the year 2045, the majority of people in the United States are, uh, are going to be people of color. And, you know, this, is, this shows the breakdown, um, but, you know, essentially we'll be living in a majority minority country, which I guess maybe at that point we'll need to use different words to describe that, but that's what we'll be looking at. So I wanted just to take a, a, a little bit of time and talk about the importance of diversity and inclusion. I mean, it really drives innovation. So to give an example of what can happen if we're not careful, um, you know, I, I took a screenshot of this uh, last year. I was kind of scrolling on, um, on social media and I saw uh, this post that talked about how Stanford just launched their Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence with great fanfare. The mission was uh, that the creators and designers of artificial intelligence must be broadly representative of humanity. There were 121 faculty members listed. And then if you know what I've underlined here, um, not a single fa uh, faculty member is black. And, and you know, I, I, I wouldn't uh, suggest that there's any ill will here. I think that it's, it's really one of the things where if you don't have you know, certain perspectives at the table, you'll miss like a major thing. I mean, you know, again, to be broadly representative of humanity and, and be missing um, the black perspective, I think is, is a real missed opportunity. Um, and so, so that's why I think it's important to just underscore how critical it is to ensure that we're kind of checking ourselves. And, and if you look around and you see that someone is missing or a particular type of perspective is missing, you know, speak up about that because it, it really does matter. Um, Teams make, make a huge difference in, uh, in sort of the, the outcomes of, of the progr progress that, we, that we're looking to make. Uh, great human accomplishments are generally achieved by a team. Uh, and then to further that, diverse teams are stronger uh, than homogenous teams. So studies show that diverse teams perform better on logical and creative tasks. And then finally, 
inclusion matters. So without an environment where all team members can contribute their best, diversity won't matter as much. So, you know, it's not just about diversity, but it's also about inclusion and building teams that are, are best equipped to solve a really complex problem. So going back to the last couple of slides, I think that the notion of having more dense cities, more diverse cities, um, and then also layering on top of that things that, you know, we can't even really expect. I think, you know, no one really expected this pandemic to, to, um, to kind of ravage our cities in the way that they have. But in order for us to be uh, resilient as we can be, we have to really um, build these diverse, uh, inclusive and impactful teams. So there's a, a, a book that I often reference called The Difference by Scott Page. And it talks about how the diverse, the power of diversity creates better groups, firms, schools, and societies. And you know, I also, um, even though as Genoma president, I often talk about racial, uh, racial uh, diversity and to some extent gender diversity. But you know, I think there's importance in looking at the diversity of diversity. So, age, uh, depth of experience, uh, skills or breadth of experience, cultures, perspectives, of course, race and ethnicity, gender, physical ability. Uh, the different networks that people are coming from or represent and uh, resources are, you know, just a, a sampling of the things that we need to make sure that, you know, the diverse teams that we're building, um, you know, represent a variety of those types of things. So, so focusing more now on our profession squarely, um, I just wanted to provide some rough statistics about where, where we stand today. So in terms of the U.S. population, 50% of our population is women. Um, but in architecture, it's only 18%. And then 17%, almost 18% of our population is Latino, uh, but in architecture, it's only 3%. For African Americans, uh, it's 13% in the US. Uh, however, in the profession, it's only 2%. For Asian Americans, it's 5.6%. Uh, and then not too far behind that, um, is the percentage of architects, which is 4%. And then for Native Americans, it is 2%. Uh, and then uh, they're representing less than 1% in the profession. And so because of these statistics that have been this way for quite some time, um, that is why I am all in for NOMA. Um, so this is me um, being, uh, you know, accepting my, my role as president in, in 2019, actually 2018 at the end of the year. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about my platform as NOMA president, uh, which is all in for NOMA. But before I do that, I'll, I'll just share with you our mission statement. So the NOMA mission is to champion diversity uh, within the design professions by promoting the excellence, community engagement, and professional development of its members. All in for NOMA is about um, two things. One, signaling that all people are welcome and encouraged to join NOMA because I, I truly believe that you know, in order for us to solve our um, most challenging problems, we do need uh, you know diverse a range of people, array of people uh, to support the effort. So it's not um, you know just for for people of color. Um, you know, it was founded by twelve African American men at the AIA conference in Detroit in 1971, um, and we're very committed to honoring that legacy. However, we think that if you know, if we want to improve the, the profession and really foster a greater sense of belonging for everyone, um, we need to be all in for NOMA. And then the other part of it is an acronym, because I love acronyms, uh, Access Leadership Legacy. So Access is really about, you know, leveraging um, the NOMA network and resources that we have available to create more access to our young people. So I, I call it K-3 licensure. licensure. So looking at um, you know, our students who are in school, uh, particularly middle school and high school, we have programming for, for them through our Noma Project Pipeline summer camps. And then also our student design competition is geared towards our um, college students and graduate students in architecture and other related fields. Uh, and then those who are in the sort of pre-licensure pipeline, um, you know, we, we wanna do what we can to support them as well. Uh, the next L is leadership. So once you get licensed, or even if, you, if you're not licensed, how do we uh, help foster uh, more opportunities for, for leaderships to become you know, a firm owner or to elevate within a small, medium, or, or large size firm, or to go into another related field that supports the work that we're you know, looking to do on behalf of the built environment. 
And then the last L is legacy. Um, you know, looking at the rich history of, of NOMA and celebrating um, our more uh, senior members as they, you know, consider, um, you know, the work that they've done over the course of their career, uh, and also looking ahead to succession planning and, and helping them be, uh, be best set up for that to, uh, you know, in an effort to give back to those in the access and leadership portions of this, this spectrum. So I'm going to just do a brief overview of some of our NOMA initiatives, um, and then I'll finish up with, um, you know, with just some ideas as to um, how you all as AIA members, um, you know, can support NOMA and, and other larger initiatives um, in the broader effort to really make sure that we build a pipeline of people, diverse people, who, um, you know, who can contribute to the future of the built environment. So our access programming, which I uh, alluded to before, um, there's the NOMA Project Pipeline Camp for middle school and high school students um, established in 2005, really in an effort to build a pipeline of architects to diversify the field. Uh, and then also our student design competition, which last year we had uh, over 40 schools um, enter the competition. Um, and then our uh, new program, the NOMA Foundation Fellowship, is geared towards um, ensuring that our recent graduates are, are supported in their tra transition from academia to the profession. And it, it's especially now more um, critical than ever that we support these young people because uh, for those of us who graduated, you know, during or around the last recession, we know how important it is to retain talent because before the pandemic hit, you know, we were seeing a bit of a talent shortage. And so now that, um, you know, now that we're kind of facing a similar situation, we have to be very intentional as a profession to make sure we don't uh, lose another generation of architects. Leadership programming. Um, so the uh, SoCal NOMA chapter is, is one of our strongest chapters. And I, I um, you know, saw Lance Collins, our um, SoCal NOMA uh, president on the call. So hello, Lance. Thank you for your leadership. Um, but we have 29 other, other chapters around the country that are doing really, really incredible things. Um, one example that I have to talk about is the NOMA Nashville Coloring Book. Um, you know, they, one of their, their members, Valerie Franklin, uh, who's actually their president, she thought about how she would bring drawings from work uh, home to her kids and they would color it. So she had the great idea to create a coloring book for kids that showcases, you know, the work of, of NOMA members, which is, which is great, not just for the kids, but also it just gives more exposure to, um, you know, to architects of color in, in the Nashville area. Um, some of the other things we do from a programming perspective um, is, well, well, one of the major things is actually our NOMA conference, um, which uh, it's an annual conference and um, it, it's growing every year. It's, it's really um, the place where it's part family reunion, but also part, you know, professional development, part, um, you know, just a, just a place where people can feel a sense of, of home in the profession while also getting CEU. So it's um, multifunctional. It's also where our student competition happens and where people just reconvene and reconnect and recharge for the year. Um, and so this is all kind of managed by NOMA National, um, where, you know, I'm the president, as you know, and then we have a, a board of about 20 people who throughout the year work tirelessly to, to make all of these things happen. And then legacy programming. Um, we've had a professional design awards program for a couple of decades now, but we actually just renamed it uh, the Phil Freeline Professional Design Awards in, in honor of our, um, our member who recently passed, Phil Freeline. Um, and then we also have scholarship funds that are, are set up in the name of, you know, various former members who, um, you know, who wanted to leave a legacy. Uh, and then uh, we're naming some of our, our fellows from the fellowship program that I previously mentioned in, the, in honor of, of other members of ours who we want to continue to, to honor. So we have 30 professional chapters and over 80 schools represented in NOMA. Um, last year, the end of the year, we had uh, 1,393 um, total members, which is uh, a record for us. The year before we had just over 900 and um, just under half of that are student members. This year, our goal for membership was 2,000. We're actually trending in that direction. However, the pandemic definitely um, hampered that goal, but we certainly hope to, um, to turn things around um, in the near future. So I, I do hope that you all consider joining us. And then uh, we wanted to double our annual budget uh, from 1 million to 2 million. So we'll, we will see how that goes, especially in this current environment. One of the things that we're working on with the American Institute of Architects Large Firm Roundtable, or LFRT, 
is um, you know, really championing diversity through what we're calling the 2030 Diversity Challenge. And um, you know, essentially it's geared towards doubling the number of African-American architects um, you know, in the profession. Uh, we've been hovering around 2% for you know, the last 50 years or since we've been keeping track essentially. And so what we're looking to do is be very aggressive about doubling those numbers, being intentional about creating programs around and creating greater access to the profession, to um, you know, to leaders in the field, and to resources to help people navigate, um, you know, all the things that are required to become licensed. And you know, sometimes we get the question, well, why, you know, why are we not focused on other, um, you know, ethnic or racial groups? And you know, frankly, what we've uh, what we've done in the, the large roundtable um, diversity task force agrees is we've focused on on one group with the intent to, to really make sure that, you know, again, the resources are available to everyone, but we're, um, you know, we're targeting certain communities to make sure that, um, you know, greater access is provided, similar to the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, you know, I, I guess when we were allowed to travel, I traveled a good amount and I, you know, had uh, my little rolly bag with me often, and I would definitely use the curb cuts, right? Because even though they weren't made for, for me as a traveler, they're made for people who are differently abled. You know, the, the notion of, of making things easier for people who have the, the greatest challenges, um, you know, that end up making it easier for everyone else. So, uh, so that's a big part of what we're looking to do, make it um, not easy in the sense that anyone can become an architect, but, you know, helping people um, navigate some of the obstacles that are, you know, often uh, financial and, uh, and otherwise. So our plan to, to meet this goal, um, you know, unfortunately doesn't really include people who are in elementary school or middle school because 2030 is only 10 years away. So we'd have to really focus on uh, our high school students, you know, those who are in high school right now, those who are in architecture school, and actually scores of people who are, um, you know, who are in the profession have just sort of not gotten around to, to licensure yet for a myriad of reasons. So we really want to focus on, on supporting those groups. And just to kind of put some faces to to those efforts, um, you know, that goes from the very young, so middle school students and high school students. Um, you know, this is actually a diagram for from our Illinois uh, chapter of NOMA or INOMA, um, and so they have a, a really strong project pipeline program, a summer design build program, and then another feeder program that um, that looks, um, you know, at helping high school students get into college where they can, you know, connect with the NOMAS chapter or NOMA student chapter. Um, and then, you know, become uh, a, a NOMA member and then get licensed. So, um, so those are some of the, um, you know, that's essentially our, our pipeline to the profession. Some of the challenges that we see include, um, you know, just a lack of awareness of the profession um, and then also connectivity to, to the work that we do and to one another can be a challenge. Um, access to resources uh, is another uh, issue that we we have to navigate, and then also incentives. So, um, you know, given the the compensation rates for for people who are uh, just enter entering the profession, and that coupled with the fact that you know we we're in school for either five, six, seven, or, or more years, you know, that becomes uh, less of an incentive. So we need to find ways to uh, to really help people understand the opportunity. Um, you know, to, to pursue this profession and to shape the future of our built environment, which is so uh, critical, especially in times like these. So talking more specifically about um, diversity and inclusion, um, I, I always like this quote from Tanya Allen of the Selman Foundation that diversity is about counting the people and inclusion is about making the people count. And that's why I think it's really important that, you know, we don't just count the people. I mean, I think it's important to have metrics, but, you know, how do you really, as a profession, foster the kind of sense of belonging that anyone, no matter what their race or um, ethnic background or um, you know, sexual orientation, gender, um, age, what have you, so that anyone feels like they can contribute, not just to the profession, but to the communities that they serve. And so one of the things that, that we're doing um, as an organization is actually providing diversity, equity, inclusion uh, consulting services. Uh, since so many of the firms that we've been uh, in touch with have asked us specifically, you know, how do they recruit and retain diverse talent? And so uh, this is our response. We've uh, created this new corporate membership program that uh, that includes opportunities for different firms to uh, to join us as a president circle 
a corporate member and then uh, receives a certain number of hours of diversity, equity, inclusion uh, consulting services um, based on the level of participation in, in the program. And then um, finally, in terms of, of NOMA and ways for, for firms to engage, even if, um, you know, if you don't uh, decide to join as a corporate member, there are so many different ways to engage in NOMA to really, um, you know, help promote this work and help to, to bolster uh, the number of people who enter the profession, uh, and particularly those who are representing underrepresented uh, backgrounds. So sponsoring a NOMA Project Pipeline camp, uh, uh, providing office space where our programs donating to either our scholarships or fellowships, um, providing youth office shadowing opportunities, recruiting interns, recruiting uh, NOMA professional members for employment, can, uh, supporting candidates in their pursuit of licensure, sponsoring the, um, the annual NOMA conference, and maintaining a firm-wide relationship with NOMA. Those are all things that will be uh, super helpful, uh, you know, as we look to partner not just with the different AIA components, but also a nationally where we have a, a memorandum of understanding where, you know, we're looking to support each other and in, in the work that we're looking to do. So thank you on behalf of NOMA and our um, you know, the future of the profession, and this is a, a snapshot from our um, Chicago group um, where they, they have like over 100 kids every year. Um, and since it is May 4th, may the 4th be with you. And remember, uh, Jedi, justice, equity, diversity, inclusion are a really big part of creating the diverse cities that we, uh, that we want to be able to thrive. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, that was great. Um, I got to thank you for your, obviously, for your dedication, but for your preparation for today, um, for sharing, um, I guess, the state of our profession as it relates, uh, then the future of our profession, actually, with all the um, kind of next generations, you know, as it relates to the social equity, diversity, uh, and inclusion. Um, and of course, a little more like you, Lay, hey, um, and the role of justice and how it, how that might, um, kind of a play in making space for the other things to happen, uh, the way I just kind of see it. Um, and um, I guess it you know, makes them actionable in that case. So, um, so thank you for that. Um, I think now we're gonna open it up um, for a Q&A. Uh, so Karine, do you wanna give us the rules of the Q&A and how it works with the chat box or the hand raising so we can get this? Sure, I'll go over that again. Um, for everybody. So, like I said, everyone remains muted unless you're called upon for a question. Um, we'd really like people to use the raise hand feature, um, which is in the participation box. You'll see the little, um, little hand that you can click on and we'll go by queue. Um, you can also put your question in the chat box and I'll either um, say, for example, Ann, we have a uh, you have a question, would you like to address your question to the group or um, I can say the question for you. And at that point, if, and if you want to join in, like right now, um, you can unmute yourself. Um, so Anne, if you want to ask your question, um, it was, uh, and if not. I had my question. Hi, there you are. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I had my question answered in the last slide, but okay. yeah, that's great. There are scholarships, so that's great to know. Um, I would like to ask a question to uh, Kimberly. Kimberly, thank you very much, first of all, for this wonderful presentation. We're very happy that you could, uh, could join us today. Uh, I wanted to uh, bring the conversation to uh, the, um, the state of the, um, the actual state and COVID-19, which is uh, largely affecting communities of uh, people of color. And uh, can you share what kind of initiatives is NOMA taking and how maybe AIA uh, can support your voice? Actually, I have two questions. The second question is, uh, one of the things that we're very proud to support every year is the um, NOMA summer camp um, um, by, by, um, by making sure that our members understand that they can, you know, they can, um, teach students uh, um, and, and participate in the, in the summer camps. How is the summer camp, this camp, summer camps, which are very relevant, gonna be affected this year? And what can we do to make sure that uh, there's still participation? Sure, well, first, thank you so much for, um, for your continued support of our project pipeline summer camps. Um, they're incredibly important to the, um, you know, to the goals that I, that I laid out earlier. And, you know, we've been thinking very, um, 
you know, very strategically about how to make sure that we don't lose the momentum that we've been building for, you know, for years and years with, you know, with the, the students and their families. And so we are looking at ways to convert um, our camps to um, a digital environment. And, you know, again, we, we don't, um, we don't have it all figured out just yet, but we're, we're very committed to making sure that um, we can still interact with our students, um, our young students in, in ways that are, are meaningful so that they, you know, can kind of catch the, um, you know, the, the opportunity of, of becoming an architect and even connecting even in this kind of format, um, you know, with architects who, who look like them and architects who don't look like them and architects of all shapes and sizes and, and all the things that, um, you know, that they um, wouldn't necessarily have exposure to otherwise. And so, um, so please stay tuned for how the, the camps are, are going to be um, administered in this new format. But, you know, first and foremost, we, we just want to make sure that our, um, our students are, are safe. Um, and so that that's going to require us to, to think outside the box in terms of uh, a virtual environment. So, and then the first question was um, specifically about the, um, the virus. And I mean, what we're trying to do, at least within the context of, of the profession, um, is make sure that our members, particularly those who've um, you know, either lost wages or have been furloughed or laid off in some cases, um, you know, making sure that we're connecting them with people who might have access to information about new opportunities and, and new ways to, um, to navigate a very challenging time. Um, we're also really, really doing our best to create more um, connectivity through communication. So we're, um, so I'm sending out a, a weekly message, not to say that that's like a solution, but I think it, it's helpful in, in helping people to know that, you know, that we're still here and that we um, want to be as supportive as we can. And then um, over the last uh, four weeks, we've been hosting, similar to, to what you're doing now, but we've been hosting uh, what we're calling our stay all in um, for NOMA event series. So we're having, so this week we're actually hosting um, a financial uh, advisor uh, who's going to talk about the CARES Act and how uh, firms, uh, firm owners can, can gain access to, to funds through that. Um, so, so again, we're, we're just looking at different ways every week to provide the kind of resources to information, um, you know, that will be helpful to our members. So I, I encourage you all to, uh, to tune into those. It seems like Maybe these happen at the beginning of the week, and then the NOMA Stay All In for NOMA series is uh, on Thursday, so you can get uh, a lot of a lot of exposure um, to to what's going on that way. Great, thank you. Um, is there anything else you wanted to add about the scholarship program at all? I know that it was in your last slide, but if there's any additional information that you wanted to share with us. Sure. So, um, I mean, if people um, are interested in donating, that's that's amazing. Um, you know, basically our scholarships are, so we have a couple of different things there. Our scholarships that are uh, geared towards HBCU students, for those who don't know what an HBCU is, it's a historically black college or university, and there are seven of them um, that uh, that have architecture programs or accredited architecture programs. So we, um, we do our best to support those programs in particular. Um, and then we also would, uh, would be you know, more than happy to take uh, donations for or investment in our NOMA Foundation Fellowship Program, which uh, this summer we're actually going to be providing um, stipends for our, our young people to be connected with different firms. So we know that firms may have a difficult time justifying um, you know, paying someone when they've let you know, people go, which you know, is, is an unfortunate reality of the situation right now. But NOMA will actually, through, you know, through the funds that we've received from our large term roundtable partners, um, we're going to um, basically redirect those funds directly to our students so that, um, not all students, we actually had a, a vetting process earlier in the year um, before the pandemic happened. We had 70 different students um, who are graduating, mostly um, our, our graduating students, applied for this fellowship program. We had 25 spots. So we um, you know, we've uh, narrowed that list down. And so at this point we are matching students with firms and then the firms and students that match up, uh, those students will actually receive a stipend from NOMA to make sure that they have, you know, at least some resources to, um, you know, to, to stay in the profession. I mean, we're, we're really looking um, at ways to, uh, to kind of plug the gap of people that, you know, we suspect are gonna um, be choosing something else. It's so important. Um, so we have a question or 
question, comment from Elisa. Do, Elisa, do you want to address the group? All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thanks for being here. Sure. Um, I my what I wrote was um, that doubling African American architects is a great goal. Have any president circle members or others adopted this specific goal within their own firms? And how might we welcome firms to commit and join this goal? That's a great question. Um, I mean, I know that the Larcher Roundtable has articulated this is, is something they want to support and continue to support. In fact, uh, LFRT has committed $50,000 to this effort over five years, so a total investment of $250,000. Um, but it's as a group. So for those who don't know, the Larcher Roundtable represents uh, the CEOs of the top 60 firms in, in the U.S. Um, and so that group gets together a couple of times a year, and it's led by uh, Carol Wedge, who is the um, CEO of uh, Shepley Bullfinch. And, um, and so, so Carol has been an incredibly uh, strong ally in this work and has you know, really gotten uh, the diversity um, task force uh, aligned um, you know, with, with what we're trying to do in, in the larger group. Um, and so I guess to more squarely answer your question, we don't have individual firms that have set certain goals. I think uh, if and this goal actually just emerged last year, so it's still, um, you know, still very much so in its early stages. But I mean, I think it's a great goal for firms to sign on to. Um, you know, we haven't created uh, a mechanism to to kind of collect um, commitments to to that effect. But one of the things that we are, um, you know, looking to do is is um, you know through our chapters, um, you know, really have. Um, you know, for example, I, I see Lance uh, in my screen here, and I know that um, SoCal Noma has done a lot to um, to create uh, programming around uh, licensure and study programs. In fact, Lance, if you don't mind, can I call you out and actually ask you to describe um, what SoCal Noma specifically is doing, and then you know uh, what we're trying to encourage a lot of our other chapters to um, to model after SoCal Noma and, and others. So, Lance, do you would you mind chiming in? Uh, sure, <laughs> I'll do that. Uh, good to see you, Kim. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, yeah, I'll chime in to say, you know, from a licensure perspective um, at the SoCal Noma chapter, we're really pushing to kind of remove all the obstacles and barriers, as many as we can, at least from people getting their license um, and, you know, and, and, so, and going so far as actually paying it for people to take their tests, uh, put together sort of at least monthly, sometimes bi-monthly study groups, virtual now that we're all kind of at home, uh, but really trying to provide enough support for members and actually developing sort of a mentor program with the younger professionals who are pursuing licensure and other senior professionals that have already become licensed, not just learn about memorizing the books and taking the test, but also becoming a professional and what that means and sort of what the roles and responsibilities are and all that. So that, you know, we've got a good group of, I think at least a dozen or more people here just in the Southern California area that are currently in that process and then, you know, in, you know, in the process of taking their exams and, you know, one, one exam or another. So, uh, you know, we hope to see those numbers increase, you know, by one or by two or by 20 as soon as we can. So that's, that's kind of what we've been doing on our end. Great. Thank you for sharing that. Sorry for putting you on the spot, but you did great. No worries. <laughs> um, so I had a few questions, actually, the people um, emailed me and one was from Ziba. Ziba, are you still here if you'd like to unmute yourself? Hi, um, I feel that my question was in some ways answered, but I can, I can reiterate it uh, and whether Kimberly have more uh, insight regarding that. I feel that, you know, for the past few years, we had a really good momentum for diversity and inclusion with a lot of companies and uh, the current crisis are putting a lot of pressure on uh, leadership and companies to really focus on how to survive. So uh, do you see that uh, diversity and inclusion being uh, compromised and going forward, do you have any insight, any, uh, any maybe positive or negative examples that you can add in that regard? 
Great. Well, thank you for the question. I mean, you know, as I, as I noted in my slides, um, you know, if, if we have very complicated problems to solve, like navigating survival in a pandemic, I think that you want to have, um, you know, the, the best team possible to kind of help navigate that. And so that's, you know, sort of a built-in natural reason to, to foster diversity, particularly at the, at the leadership level, but really at all levels. Um, and one of the things that I often talk about is, um, you know, diversity isn't unlike profitability, like you're always looking at profitability. Um, so if you are profitable one year, you can't say, okay, all right, I've achieved profitability. Like you have to keep doing the, the things that kind of set you up for success. And I think um, it's similar with diversity. Um, you know, it would be great if at some point we're not, um, you know, worried about it because we, you know, we, we've naturally kind of built um, you know, a pipeline into the profession for, you know, people of all different backgrounds to, to find their home here, um, you know, in architecture and to contribute their best to solve all the problems. But until then, I think we have to be really intentional about our recruitment and our retention. But in, in the context of this pandemic, um, I mean, I do think that while firms have to make difficult decisions about, um, about who um, they have to let go of, I think that still looking at um, the bigger picture of, um, you know, just like who's represented, like what, what voices are going to be lost if you end up having to make reductions? Um, you know, how do we make sure that not all of the people of color are, are you know, part of the, the layoffs, for example? I mean, that's, that's a clear example of really, really negative outcomes. But, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's tough no matter what, having to let go of anyone. But I think that we have to still, um, to some extent, curate our, um, you know, our teams to make sure that we are representing the, the voices that um, that will help us to optimally navigate challenging situations. Great. Um, I has, also had a question from Philip Hart. Philip, do you want to unmute yourself? Sure. Uh, Kimberly, good presentation. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, Hello. Uh, I'm very familiar with Detroit. I went to Michigan State University, so I know Hudson Department Store very well. Um, I have a question, a broader question. Today's Boston Globe had two articles. One was about the uh, in negative impact of density upon the spread of the uh, virus. And the second one is about the power of cities, about how we reconfigure our cities moving forward which obviously architecture and urban planning and development have a role in. I just want your opinion about that uh, question about how our, our, the debate of our cities moving forward is affected by the virus. Sure, uh, that's actually an excellent question. And my, um, my team and my day job at HOK, we talk about that pretty regularly given, um, you know, the firm has so many different disciplines. We actually had an interdisciplinary discussion between our planning group and our urban design group and our sustainability group and our chief medical officer to talk about, you know, how can we as a firm, but also more broadly as a profession, um, how can we attack these issues head on? Um, you know, at least the group of us that were um, convened last week to discuss what we're going to do about this, um, we came to the conclusion that uh, cities are still, um, you know, incredibly important to our society and that they're only going to continue to be um, uh, critical for us. Um, I mean, yes, there are lots of there. There are several other you know options that people have, and certainly I think people will look at this pandemic and then you know choose um, you know perhaps a different lifestyle. But ultimately, what we're looking to do is building um, you know is build a case for um, creating cities that are more resilient, that foster greater health um, and equal opportunity and, and equity for people. Because I think that. Um, if we get it right, like if we if we have diverse teams that are working on the problem from many different angles, like for example, um, you know, it's not just about architecture, but it's about public policy. It's about, you know, going to the planning commissioner, the planning director, and, and talking through, um, you know, certain interventions that can actually help to improve health outcomes for, uh, for under-resourced community, communities and communities of color in particular that are, um, you know, most drastically affected, um, but also looking at um, you know, ways that we can densify in, uh, you know, again, more sustainable and resilient ways. Uh, and so I don't think that cities are, um, you know, quote unquote, the problem. I think that they actually can be part of the solution, but we have to figure out the right way to, um, to design them in the future and develop them in the future. 
So, um, so it's, it's still, I mean, I don't have like an exact answer, but I do, um, you know, I'm taking the position that cities are not the problem. I think they, um, you know, there, there were examples of cities, particularly in New York City, um, where because of all the density and, all, and also just the, the delay in information sharing and, you know, just uh, lack of control relative to, um, you know, just getting a handle on the virus. I think that that, um, you know, that definitely um, didn't bode well, but I, I think that we still have to stay the course with our cities um, and just make sure that going forward, we can prevent uh, the kinds of, of spread and, and um, exacerbated problems that we saw uh, this go round. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Um, we have at least seven more minutes. We'd love to hear from more of you. I'm sure people have um, more questions or, um, you know, Lance, if you, oh, Lance, your hand is up. I'm so sorry, I didn't see that. Please unmute yourself. No worries, thank you. Um, you know, I, I guess I wanted to ask a question. This is sort of a question and or a challenge to the AIALA chapter. Um, and we, you know, Kim talked a lot about legacy um, and what that sort of means as far as the individual, but I want to kind of understand what are some opportunities or resources that are, are available for supporting minority owned firms here locally and, and, and beyond, uh, especially during COVID-19 uh, times, but it's certainly been a topic uh, pre-coronavirus as a lot of minority firms have just disappeared over the years. Um, to where there's only maybe a half a dozen to less than uh, 10 left in Southern California area where, you know, we've lost all the big names, Paul Williams and others, their firms are all gone. What can the AIA LA chapter do to help in that process of maintaining that legacy? I think I can take this and actually, thank you, Lance. I will also invite Will Wright to, uh, to speak up on, the, on behalf of this, uh, of this um, issue. Uh, as you know, you, you, you have participated in our, um, in our annual conference uh, to discuss issues of diversity, inclusivity, um, and compass. And this year, no matter what, we'll, we will be holding one in, uh, in uh, September. And uh, we have a dedicated task force. We have two people on this call, Ziba Gassemi and Leslie Stigner, uh, that will help us also craft again uh, the topics of this conversation. And I think that we have discussed uh, previously issues of um, uh, networking and relations with the city and procurement. Uh, um, and uh, um, uh, this is, a, I think that this is basically, it's an ongoing uh, topic. And I think it would be uh, great if we could actually get together more often and really uh, discuss how we can best coordinate, what, 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 how we can best collaborate with regards to this kind of issues. Will, do you want to say something about this, please? You need to unmute yourself. You need to unmute yourself, Will, please. Hello. There you go. There you go. So I, I was playing, uh, I was trying to unmute myself and I think someone else was trying to unmute me at the same time. Uh, yeah, thanks for the uh, question, Lance. You know, the, the public agencies do have a, you know, a goal, but I think the good faith effort, or the I don't think that's good enough anymore. And I think we really need to look at legislation to fix that. Um, I know LA County and Metro have a, a set aside for, uh, you know, contracts for small and you know, minority owned firms. But I, I think it's, those set asides usually go to the subs. And I think it's really a matter of like, let's ensure that the, the prime contract is going to that minority owned firm and then let that prime contract then therefore um, partner with some of the, the, the larger firms that are usually always the prime. And I think that, you know, as we struggle through this procurement reform issue, I feel like most of the barriers really are at the state level with some of the uh, legislation that was written. And it's, you know, how do we, as a, as, a, as a leadership organization from Southern California, really work with Sacramento to remove some of those barriers? Um, you know, this is something that for the last 10 years, we've been sort of spinning our wheels on because uh, good faith effort obviously just isn't doing the job anymore. And it just uh, takes a lot of energy to check those boxes and it's not really moving us forward in any meaningful way. And so I, I'm looking at it as a, re a as regulatory barrier itself. Uh, the will of the people are there to ensure that this work is going uh, to qualified firms. 
but it's just, you know, how do we make sure that this uh, good faith effort isn't just simply uh, an exercise, but it's actually, you know, achieving results. All right. Well, we have a few more minutes. If anybody has another question to wrap this up. Um, hi, Anne. I'm going to unmute you. Hi. And again, thank you, Kimberly. I haven't met you before, but thank you. Um, do those seven universities have any archives? I'm actually thinking a little bit similar to the uh, VPI or Virginia Tech archives for women in architecture and design um, in terms of the legacy. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. So the seven universities, um, I, so one of, one of the uh, universities that I do believe has an archive, I'm not sure how extensive it is, but it's Howard University and I think Hampton may have one as well. Um, but we'll have to, you know, do additional um, research to, to figure out what, what resources the different um, HBCs have. But, um, you know, I, I would suspect that, um, you know, once we do uh, look into it, we're going to find that, you know, there's, there's so much more that can be done. Um, I mean, even more immediately, we, we have the Directory of African American Architects, which is hosted by the University of Cincinnati right now. Um, and, you know, we're looking at finding resources to, uh, to, uh, sustain that particular program, which actually helps us to count, um, you know, the number of, of licensed black architects in the country. Um, and in fact, it's, it's such an important um, tool, particularly for black women, which represent far less than a percent of the entire profession. Um, you know, we, like, we actually know what number uh, and sequence we were licensed. Uh, so I'm like number 295. Um, and so I shouldn't know that, but, but I do because of the direct, Directory of African American Architects. So um, so that's one resource that um, that we definitely want to uh, to better uh, support and leverage um, to to kind of create the, the data that we need to to solve the uh, to solve the problem. But then also to your point, um, the archives that uh, that either exist or should exist at those universities and probably others as well, um, it, it would be really helpful to um, to support those. So thank you for that question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Greg, do you want to wrap it up and then I'll, I'll say a few words at the end? Uh, just thanks again to all of you that joined in today, especially uh, thank you to Kimberly. Very nice to meet you uh, before this call. Uh, appreciate you being on a different time zone and calling in and helping out. Yeah. Um, and um, I guess uh, with, with that, or there's going to be a series of these that continue to fly out of the uh, our great, uh, our great chapter, Carlo and team are working hard at putting these together uh, on a biweekly basis. Some, some of them are weekly. Um, I hope that in uh, September, um, there, there may be a, an actual physical event that we can all attend uh, <clears throat> and learn from uh, when Encompass is slated to, to happen. And um, that's all I, I have right now. So. Uh, 